All right, so as I mentioned, we're talking about love. Look at your neighbor and say, love. Love. You got you to say love with a little bit of, mm. yeah, I don't love, <laughs> right? Um, I want to tell you, I want to start out by telling you a story. Is that okay? Yes. All right, good. This, this side's excited and this side, you'll get there, hopefully. All right, once there were two farmers. They were neighbors, but they had a feud that lasted for years. Okay, no, this isn't Yellowstone. Okay, this is, this is something different. Okay, the grudge grew to the point that one of the farmers dug a ditch to reroute a spring in order to divide their properties. One day, a carpenter came through the area looking for work, and the carpenter knocked on one of the farmer's doors. And the farmer thought, if he's going to divide us with that ditch, I'll finish the job by putting a fence up. And so he asked the carpenter to build a big, tall fence across the property. And the carpenter said, "Great." I can do that, but it's going to take a lot of wood. So the farmer went into town to buy more wood, and the carpenter started to build the fence, working on the fence with the wood that was in the shed. And the farmer started back with a load of wood, and as he drove down the road to his home, he looked across the field, but he didn't see a fence. Instead, he saw that the carpenter had built a bridge across that ditch, across that creek. And there... Across the bridge was his neighbor who came walking toward him with his hand outstretched and a big grin on his face saying, you're a brave man, he said. I didn't think you'd want to hear the sound of my voice again. Can you forgive me? The first farmer was shocked. He was surprised as he reached out his hand to shake his neighbors. And that's the story um, written by a singer-songwriter named David Wilcox who uses it as an introduction to a song that he wrote called Fearless Love. And the song goes on to weave together another narrative that is about a church protest and a person that was caught up in it and who remembered Jesus' teaching to his disciples to love their enemies by using the example of carrying a Roman soldier's pack twice the distance required. And the chorus goes like this. I'm not going to sing it because I want you to come back to church. But the chorus goes like this, fearless love makes you cross a border. That's true, isn't it? Fearless love makes you cross a border. The love that Jesus displayed to the world that we're celebrating and that we're wearing buffalo plaid for is indeed fearless love. Lacking any fear, the love of Jesus defies and overcomes fear. Today, As we continue our journey through this season of Advent, this season of expectancy, we choose to focus on the love that Jesus brought into the world and to our lives. So as a quick recap, for those of you who haven't uh, uh, been around or you've missed missed, uh, a Sunday or two over the month, the word Advent means coming or arrival, right? So tomorrow morning when you text your family and say you're, you're coming to their house, you can say, I'm adventing to your house. I'm coming to your house, right? Don't do that. That'd be a little weird. Um, but the season's marked by expectation. And one of the things that we say around here a lot, especially uh, this, this time of year, is that God meets us at the level of our expectation, right? God meets us at the level of our expectation. So this season's marked by expectation. It's marked by waiting. It's marked by anticipation. It's marked by longing, right? Advent is not just an extension of Christmas. It's a rediscovery of Christmas. We talked about that last week when we talked about rejoicing and joy. That, that, that the word rejoice is literally to put joy back into a season that links past, present, future. Advent offers us the opportunity to share And the ancient longing for Jesus to celebrate his birth, to be alert and ready for him to come again. Advent looks back in celebration at the hope fulfilled in Jesus' coming. That Christianity is the only uh, um, religion marked with hope because we have a future. It looks in celebration and, and, and hopeful and eager anticipation to the coming of Jesus when he will return. And so we've been looking at different people in the nativity story over these last few weeks. We've looked at the experience of certain individuals, and today we're going to take a little bit of a different approach than maybe you're used to on the Sunday of love, okay? But I want to look at everyone's, uh, everyone in the biblical account of Jesus' birth, and as we do, 
I want us to realize that the birth of Jesus brings together a wide variety of people from across many different lifestyles, ages, and situations to worship together in one place. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1-12 through 12 goes like this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? Who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling, assembling the, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, verse 8, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you found him, bring me word that I too may come worship him. Not his plan. Right? Not his plan. That I too may come worship him. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now, typically in this situation, we would look at the significance of the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, and how they were all uh, precursors to the life of Jesus, the life that he was going to live, the reason that he came to this earth. But that's not where we're going today, although it's good, and you can look into that if you are interested, or you could just go back to last year and look at December 25th's message, because that's what I preached on last year, December 25th. So, Knock yourself out. But if we walk through the story in order, if we think back to where we've gone over this last month, we start with Zachariah and Elizabeth, right? That, 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 that they were told in their old age that they were going to bear a son, that he was going to prepare the way for Jesus. Then, then we look at Mary and Joseph, right? They were younger, not yet married, right? The Virgin Mary was going to give birth, another, another not possible situation. And we see here that in the combination of Zachariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, we see the old and we see the young together in the Christmas story. The prophets of Israel's past and the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah and the new spiritual future, the separation and death of the past and the restoration and life that is now present, then we meet the shepherds and the angels. We talked about the shepherds being out in the field, watching over their flocks by night, the stars lit. Did everybody enjoy Monday night under the stars, no electricity at all in the state of Maine? If you had electricity, now is not the time to say, I had electricity, because there's people in here that might jump you. <laughs> in the love of Jesus, obviously, right? Right? But we talked about the shepherds, we talked about the angels, and how the, the, the angels uh, stirred fear in, in people. Uh, the beings of earth and the beings of heaven, the physical and the spiritual. As they head to the stable, there's animals and mankind, who, all who witness the birth of this Jesus. And then next we meet the magi, or the magi, or as we call them today, wise men, the three kings, right? Which is interesting because... We don't really know if it was three. It could have been ten. We assume three because they only brought three gifts, frankincense, gold, and myrrh. I did that out of order, and that's going to bother some people, but that's okay. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But we meet these magi in Matthew's Christmas account. Who were these mysterious visitors from the east? And quite frankly, other than what we just read, we're, we're not entirely sure about them. We don't know much of them. We don't know really where they came from. We know they followed a star 
an incredibly long distance to find and worship the promised Jesus, the promised Messiah. That's what we know. And at any rate, they were, whether they were astrologers or some kind of rulers or, or magicians, they were noble and wealthy men who demonstrated God bridging the divides of mankind. Because you had these lowly shepherds, right? You had the young Mary and Joseph. You had the older Zachariah and Elizabeth. You had the angels present. You had all of these present. And then you had the rich rulers, wherever they came from. And so you can see where we're going with this, right? The mad guy were completely the opposite, clearly the opposite of the lowly shepherds in the social structures. They wore different clothes. They more than likely smelled better. Yet more importantly, if you look into them enough, they were Gentiles, not Jews. And their inclusion in the birth of Jesus echoes this radical idea that Jesus, the Messiah, brings salvation and restoration to all people. And so the birth of Jesus shows us that Jesus brings salvation and restoration to all people, not just the Jews. The Magi were also thought to be holy men of some sort. They seemed to belong to more of a mystical tradition than the Jewish leaders. And in contrast, the spiritual Jewish leaders of the day. But we find in this place where Jesus was born, there were no spiritual VIPs present at the time. There were none invited to the birth of Jesus. Instead, there were these travelers of a different place, of a different race, who received an audience with King Herod. And who were willing to disrupt their lives with a great journey and humble themselves to worship the baby of a poor, unassuming couple in the countryside. A baby thought to be the king of the Jews. And so the cast of characters here that we look at at the Christmas story every year that God assembled for the arrival of His Son on earth is far from the expectations that any of us would have imagined. And far from the expectations of people of that day who lived within that culture and its social divisions. And to us, it may seem like a ragtag bunch of people. To others, it may have seemed blasphemous. How in the world can they be in the same place worshiping? Because it it says the shepherds went to worship. The three wise men went to worship. Worship. Everybody in this story goes following the star, following the light to worship. It may have seemed blasphemous that the Messiah would be associated with an unclean bunch of people, humanity, and creation. But there's three things that I want to point out to you about love that we see here as a result of what I've shared with you already this morning. Is that all right? Okay. The first one is this. Jesus is love embodied. Jesus is love embodied. Pastor Travis, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Let's talk about it. The Bible talks about love in many places. We're going to look at a lot of them today. and More than likely, you won't be able to jot down all of the references, and we're not going to look at all of them on the screen or anything like that. But the Bible talks about love in many places. God is love and the Bible is his love story for all humanity, front to, in, to end, beginning to end, front to back, Genesis to Revelation. Okay, God spent time with mankind from the time of creation, Adam and Eve in the garden, as companions and children. And when sin entered the world, it brought death. It brought brokenness. It brought separation from such a close relationship with God. But get this, God never, and the Old Testament gets a little... It gets a little, I'm not devaluing, I'm just saying it gets a little crazy. You go into Leviticus and other places and it's, anyway, right? But, but God never turned his back on his people. Through all of that, through all of it, God never turned his back on his people. He continued to work all throughout. 
generations and generations, he worked his plans and fulfilled his promise of a Messiah to make a way to restore relationship with humanity. And that way is Jesus, who is described as the groom and the church as his bride. The relationship with God is a relationship of love. It's a reunion with love itself. John the Apostle describes the love of God in the fourth chapter of his letter, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 16, like this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the replacement for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. What John's saying is no one's ever seen God, but if you truly love people, they can see God's love through you and in you. By this, verse 13 We know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He is in God. And so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Here it is again. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides, abides in him. That word abide means to dwell. John tells us that God is love, that God personifies it, that love is his nature, that he has shown it to us by sending Jesus. And when we come to Jesus, giving him our lives, we are restored to love. We are fulfilled in love. We live in Him. He lives in us. And we can count on God's love to never let us down. The love of God fills us and fuels us. It calls us and enables us to love each other. We don't love one another. You don't love the person next to you out of your own strength. Sometimes it takes supernatural strength, doesn't it? Especially in seasons of chaos. Stress levels are high, right? I, 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 I love you and I'm trying to like you type moments, right? All of those things. God's love never fails us. Jesus embodies that love for He is love. Number two, love defines us and propels us. It's the energy now, something, something happened to me um, a couple Saturdays ago, um, and, it, and it happened again this past week. Many of you know, because I've confessed some of the backlash of this, that Memorial Day weekend of 2023, one thing I've done this year, I can't decide if it's been positive or negative, good or bad, but that's okay, it's up for debate. Different people have different feelings about what I'm about to share with you and confess with you this morning, but... Memorial Day of 2023, I decided that I was going to go off caffeine completely. I used to drink caffeine nonstop, like 8 o'clock at night, cup of coffee, all good in the hood, right? I mean, just, just go for it. And so I've, I've been drinking decaf. And so here's the thing about quitting something. If you quit something, I feel like you have to quit it completely. And so I felt like since Memorial Day weekend, I've been cheating. Because I'm off caffeine, but I'm still addicted to coffee. Like, I just still love coffee. And decaf coffee stinks. <laughs> Let's just be honest. It's like an oatmeal raisin cookie versus a chocolate chip cookie. There's trust issues all over that, right? That's reasons people go to therapists, right? Because somebody slips them a cookie and you're about to eat that thing and you're like, oh yes, this is going to be good. And it's oatmeal raisin and you're just like, Bleh, ah. <laughs> Right? And I know somebody in here is thinking, well, Pastor Travis, that's just because you haven't had my oatmeal raisin cookie. Nope, don't bring it to me. <laughs> I can tell you where it's not going in here, okay? All right? 
Bless your heart, I'm sure it's great. Okay? Back to the story, all right? I went off decaf coffee on Memorial Day weekend, and a couple of times in the last couple of weeks, I have been like, whoo, joyful. Like, to the point of singing, to the point of bringing out my southern accent, to the point where I was at a softball practice, and someone looked at me and said, well, you're chatty this morning, so obviously annoying. <laughs> right? I've been to the point of annoying. If somebody looks at you and says, oh, you're chatty this morning, that's not a compliment. It means they want you to be quiet. <laughs> Just helping you out, okay? I learned that the hard way. All right. Because the two mornings in the last couple weeks, my coffee has not been, to my surprise, non-intentional, it's not been decaf. It's been high test. And on Wednesday morning, when I had that decaf, venti, peppermint mocha from Starbucks that was not decaf, and I came into church just full of the joy of the Lord, I was, I mean, there were like 19 pickleballers in here, and I was greeting every single one of them with a kiss. No, I'm just kidding. I wasn't doing it. <clears throat> right? I wasn't, I wasn't doing that. But what's the point of that? Right. Okay. The point, the point is this, right? There are so many things that propel us. There's so many things that define us. There's so many things that we are labeled with today. You know what the most important one is? The love of Jesus. See, here, we're not going to turn here. We're not going to turn here because God just put this on my heart this morning as I was praying with the worship team. Okay, but in Ephesians 5, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. And he says in Ephesians 5, 1, imitate Christ, therefore, as his dear children. Right? Imitate Christ, therefore, as his dear children. I've talked about that often. And you know what Paul goes on to talk to the church at Ephesus about? He goes on to talk about love your wife as Christ loved the church. He gives marriage instructions, but the point, and, and here's why I believe we miss the context of this so, so deeply as the church of Jesus, because we get distracted by the, by the marriage advice of Paul. But really, it's just an illustration for us to grasp the depth at which Jesus absolutely, undeniably, sacrificially loves the church. He loves this. He loves this. And we and, and look, even with that, we've got to break the, the mold and the training in our minds that associates that when Jesus loves the church, we think he's loving this building. Jesus doesn't give a rip about this place as much as he gives care to you worshiping in this place, as much as he cares about how we're using this place. As much as he, are we using it for His glory? Are we using it to see lives change, people push to Jesus, right? Those are the things He cares about because the reality is the church is not a place, it's a people. And so, and so Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus and he's saying, listen, Jesus is madly in love with you, the people that are gathered together. And my prayer is your pastor. You can't get rid of me. Well, actually you can. It's in our bylaws and all the instructions, right? But, but I'm staying until we as a people grasp what it's like to be a people of love that God intended His church to be. And we're not even close to it. We're not even close to it. I mean, Scripture says, That you will be known as the body of Christ, the church of Jesus, by your love. By your love. By your sacrificial love. And Paul and Paul is saying, imitate Christ, therefore, sister dear children. Love the church. Love the body. Look, there's differences. There's annoyances, but don't you have those in kids? And you love them? At times, not all the time, kids. I've got a couple kids in the room. I've got to be careful. Right? But you love them. There's not a thing you wouldn't do for them. 
Right? And we've got we've to stop seeing the church as a place. As a checkbox. As, a, as this thing that we do. We've got to start seeing it as a people. We gotta stop seeing it. Start seeing it as a people. That's why when people, man, when 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 people, and it have, yeah, it, woo, 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 I don't want any, I don't want any sympathy or whatever on Christmas, right? It's not not about this. But there's two weeks of the year that I just dread as a pastor. Let me be honest with you, Easter and Christmas, hands down, because this, there's something about those two holidays that people just get bold. They just get bold, and they're willing to say anything, right? And it's amazing, it's amazing how we can shift our focus at the time of the biggest two celebratory things for the church and look inward. There are people here right now. There are going to be more people here at 4 p.m. Hopefully. Don't I'm not talking about people in general, but hear me. That need Jesus. That need His love. That need Him. And my prayer, because we say this all the time at Summit, the body's most effective when the body ministers to the body. Right? The body's most effective when the body ministers to the body. You know what we mean by that? Is that the church is most effective, the people of God are most effective when they love one another and they don't depend on a couple hired hands to do the loving. It's on all of us. It's on all of us. It's on each and every one of us to realize that what we're doing here in this place, fire and all, is to love people as best we can to Jesus. That's what it means when we talk about the love of Jesus propels us, it defines us. It defines us. That my prayer for us, a new commandment, John 13 says this, I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. As Jesus teaches his disciples he wants to make sure that they love one another like he loves and here's the most important part regarding love how will people know if a person is a follower of jesus by the love that they show one another and to other people right the love of Christ is what defines us. It marks us. It characterizes us. And so my question for us today is this. Am I displaying the love of Jesus to those around me? Am I displaying the love of Jesus to those around me? Listen, that does not mean, and we could, we could speak all day about this, right? You guys just want to stay till 4 o'clock and we'll kick into the next service? Fine with me if you want to. Right? Because we could talk all day about this, right? This does not mean I do not love you by enabling you in bad habits and sin. Right? That's what many of us think of when we think of love. Oh, we've got to love. We, you, you've got to accept me, right? No. I love my kids as they are, but I pray, I pray that they are better than me one day. I do not want them to stay as they are. I don't. They've got to take care of me one day. <laughs> they can't do that in the way they care for themselves currently. Right? I'm not putting that on you. But it'd be nice. Something to pray about. Right? We don't coddle people in love and let them stay the same. No, in love, I push you to be better. When it's the time. When I've earned the right to be heard and, and do that, right? That's where every illustration breaks down. Right? But hear me. Love does not mean that we just accept and turn a blind eye. 
right? Love is sometimes accountability. Love is what defines us. Number three, going back to our story of the farmers, love empowers us to cross borders. Powerful story here in, um, in Luke chapter 10, 30 through 35. A lot of you have heard it. It's going to be on the screen, I believe. Yep. Um, Luke 10, 30 through 35. It's the story of the Good Samaritan, right? I just want to show you one thing here. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to, to Jericho, right? The, the distance, the elevation difference from Jerusalem to Jericho is like 3,000 feet, right? Think of it, Mount Washington's 4,000 feet. Is that right, Ben? 4,000 feet. So, thousand feet difference, right? So in the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho going down, I've always found that fascinating because he was literally going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leave, left him half dead. It's a bad day. Now by chance, by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A lot of things we could talk about. The priest would have known... Um, would have known the, at least the first five books of the Old Testament, if not the entire Old Testament. What better person to take care of this person than the priest? But he probably had a prayer meeting to get to. Then verse 32, so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, a Levite would have been the type of person that attended everywhere but belonged nowhere, right? They just, they just, they were at every church event, right? They were, they were the, the Christian who was a mile wide and a centimeter deep. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan. Now the, 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 the significance here is that this person, this Jew that was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and this Samaritan would have been from two different camps. It would have been Patriots and Giants. It would have been Duke in North Carolina. It would have been Red Sox, Yankees. They do not belong in the same room. It's only by the grace of God that we have each of those represented in this room. Except I don't know of a Yankee fan. Bummer. And giants? It's a good thing you got a haircut. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where he was, and when he saw him, get this, this is what I want you to see, he had compassion. When he saw him, he had compassion. You know what went out of the window? Everything that divided them. Everything that separated them. In the moment of this man's need, when he was there, laying half dead, he had been beaten, clothes stripped off of him. The only thing that, mat the only thing that mattered was he needed love. And this Samaritan, the most unlikely person in the entire story, is the one that God stirs in the heart of to have compassion. He went, he bound up his wounds, he poured on oil and wine, then he set him on his animal. Brought him to an end. Took care of him. Look how generous he was in love. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And if you spend any more, whatever you spend more, I'll repay you when I come back. I'll repay you when I come back. You know, that's like, Home Alone too, the room service bill, right? I mean, whatever, whatever you rack up in rooms, whatever you need, right? Whatever you need, I'll repay you on your behalf when I come back. Family, that's powerful. At times, at times, and, and, and here's, the, here's the rub, right? Here's the, here's the difficulty. This may be you this morning. Right? And you're looking at tomorrow almost with a level of, of dread. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure where you're at. But at times, certainly each and every one of us in the room, we found ourselves divided or at odds with someone. However, we are to love deeply because of this. Love covers over a multitude of sins, according to 1 Peter 4. Oh, but Pastor Travis, you don't know. It doesn't matter. That's the point of love. That's the point of this sacrificial love is that it doesn't matter what they did to you. It doesn't matter what they said to you. It doesn't matter how they stabbed you in the back. It doesn't matter how they left you lonely. It doesn't matter how the, the church shouldn't be like that. They're human. And you are called to love as Jesus loved. And they are too. 
But you're not going to stand one day and be held accountable for what they did. You're going to stand one day and be held accountable for how you responded. For how you loved in response. That's why Scripture says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You can't control their response, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace at everyone. Because here's the, here's the belief that I have this morning, family, and you may say it's young, naive, whatever. God's love can heal any divide. God's love can heal any divide. There may need to be boundaries around that. There, need to, there may need to be some, some things put in place for your protection, for your safety, for the, for, the, for the care of your heart, right? All of those different things. But the divide, the bridge can be built. The bridge can be built. Because God's love is so radical. If you go back to... There's always been the weak and powerful. If you go back to the, the shepherds and the wise men... Throughout history, the world's been full of wars and greed and plunder, oppression. There's always been the weak, the powerful, the haves, the have-nots. There's always been the us versus them as far back in history as we can go. And even as Jesus displayed and preached the love of God, the us's and them's divided the Jew and Gentile, the rich and poor, the man and woman, the religious and non-religious, the godly and ungodly, and sadly, it's still a reality today. But Matthew 5, 43 and 44, Jesus says, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. You've heard, it, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Is that our first response? When we love as Jesus loves, I believe it is. Jesus didn't only tear down the walls of division at His birth. He continually reaches across the, the divide. Jesus befriended the hate of tax collectors. He, he even invited Matthew, a tax collector, to follow him as one of his 12 disciples. Jesus spoke with a Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, which Jews considered to be wrong at the time. Je Jews didn't associate with Samaritans, and Jewish men certainly didn't talk with, with women like that in public. And Jesus told his listeners that if a Roman soldier forced them to carry his pack for a mile, something Roman soldiers could demand to go further and carry it two miles. Jesus modeled this radical love that reached across the ditch. Maybe reaching across the divide begins with you this morning. Jesus calls us together into His loving presence and invites us to make room for all. Luke 14, there's a seat at the table. There's a seat at the table for you. We're about to take communion in just a few moments. And if you love Jesus this morning... There's a seat at the table for you at Summit's table. There's a seat at the table. There's humility in love, a willingness to put someone else first. And sometimes it means this. Sometimes love means taking the simple step of building a bridge, as in the story of the farmer. Sometimes love is deciding that building a bridge is more important than harboring bitterness. I once had somebody tell me years ago, it's okay to preach hurt, it's not okay to preach bitter. But if we let that hurt hang on there too long, it turns to bitterness, doesn't it? Sometimes love means taking the simple step of building a bridge. Number two, sometimes it means being willing, I'm great at this, just ask my family. Sometimes it means being willing to listen and not defend. Or make a case for yourself as to why you are the way you are. I've hit my head too many times on doorways. Right? Thanks, Mike. Number three. Love is always being willing to choose to see someone else as equally loved by God. As equally welcomed into His presence. As equally drawn into the divine and all-consuming 
love of God. There's not a special love that I have access to that you don't because I'm a pastor. There's not a special access of love that you have because you've been serving the church longer than the person next to you. God's love is available and accessible and equally drawn for everyone. As we approach tomorrow, as we approach this afternoon, some of you told me this morning your, your gatherings are almost over. However you're sitting this morning, because the message of love is bigger than an Advent Sunday. It's bigger than the week of Christmas. It's bigger than this month. It's meant to be 365 days a year, every moment that we encounter people. As we approach this, though, let's rediscover Christmas by rediscovering the overwhelming, all-encompassing, and all-welcoming love of God. As we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, just listen to these. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Ephesians 4. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. A little bit further down, we've already talked about it this morning. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 John 3.16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. We love because we want to reflect the very character of God. See, Jesus is patient and kind to the body of Christ. He doesn't he, he doesn't boast. He's not arrogant or rude, 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus doesn't insist on his own way. Jesus is not irritable or resentful. Jesus does not rejoice at wrongdoing. He rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things. He endures all things. Jesus and his love for the church never end. And listen to me, family. Pastorally, I have the responsibility to look at Summit from a biblical perspective Biblically objective way. There's so much good here. So much good here. Amen? Man, there's so much good here. I mean, even the decaf coffee's good here. They did that for me. There's so much potential here. There is so much giftedness here. However, I sometimes grieve what often appears as a lack of love among us. And not just us, but the church as a whole, the big C church. What often appears as a lack of love, that we are a people known more for what we're against than what we're for. Let me be clear. My call this morning is to call you from love from the love of Jesus at his birth to love. Do you love Jesus this morning? Because you can never love the church until you love him. Father, thank you for your love for us. And God, I pray today first that we would embrace that love that you intended for us, the greatest gift we could ever receive. God, I pray that you stir in our hearts because of that to love the person across the aisle from us. To love the people in this room. To love the people that you've called us together with for such a time as this. To change the world. By being called your church by being known as a people of love. And God, thirdly, I pray that you break our hearts in love for this community. For Gorham. For Westbrook. For Buxton. Scarborough. Wyndham. Standish. Father, 
God, for the people around us that we come in contact with every day. Portland, South Portland. God, that You break our hearts for what breaks Yours. The question, do they know the love of Jesus? Not do they like the same music that I like. Not do they even have the same moral code that I have. Not are they sinless. Because God, we can't be without You. And so God, I pray that You would teach us in love to put ourselves and our preferences and our opinions aside for what matters most for eternity. May we stop digging ditches as your church. Help us to build more bridges. Still grounded and founded in truth. Help us to be known as a people for which you intended us to be known for. And it starts with that being individual. And so as we come to your table today, God, I pray that every person in this place is reminded of your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come to the table when you're ready.